Hello chemistry students. In this video I'm going to go over colligative properties. Alright, so colligative properties apply only when you have a non-volatile solute. Um, generally speaking, the easiest way to identify a non-volatile solute is that it is a solid solute. Like it will be from an ionic compound or um, a molecular solid. So things like sodium chloride and sucrose or table sugar. Those would be good examples of uh, of non-volatile solutes. Colligative properties uh, do not depend on the identity of the solute, but they do depend on the number of particles produced as the solute dissolves. So uh, three colligative properties here are boiling point, freezing point, and vapor pressure. And I'll just make a point here that uh, something such as electrical conductivity, that would not be a colligative property. It it uh, does depend on the identity of the solute because remember ionic compounds and acids they conduct electricity quite well uh, but molecular compounds do not so electrical conductivity would not be a colloidal property all right here's a real life example so uh, you may have noticed that you know DOT trucks drive around and dump uh, salt on the road uh, and that helps uh, melt the ice. Now the reason why that helps melt the ice is because the salt uh, lowers the freezing temperature of the ice meaning that it uh, melts into a liquid and that liquid form can run off of the road. All right, so let's go over a few things here with the different types of colligative properties. The first we'll start with is vapor pressure lowering. So let's start off with what is vapor pressure? Well, vapor pressure is the pressure that builds up in a closed container due to the evaporation of a liquid that is contained within that container. Um, lighters that contain butane, you press the button, it lets the gas out, the the liquid in the container evaporates. Sometimes you can actually see it bubble as the gas is escaping, um, and that produces um, that that produce that evaporation produces the pressure that pressurizes the lighter. Some, something similar happens inside of aerosol cans. Uh, propane tanks are another example, and if you've ever um, taken the lid off of a gas can when you know when it was hot or something, you might have heard a. Psh and that was the vapor pressure uh, from the evaporation of that gas being released. Okay, in order for a uh, liquid to evaporate, the solvent molecules, the liquid molecules, must escape through the surface of the liquid. So if you have a solute dissolved, those solute molecules will get in the way of the solvent molecules being able to escape or evaporate from the surface. And uh, Raoult's law, which is shown here, just for uh, you're not going to have to do calculations, don't worry, um, not in this class anyways. But basically it just says that um, the more uh, moles of solvent you have, the closer you're going to be to the original vapor pressure. Because if it was all moles of solvent, then your moles of solvent divided by your total moles, those numbers would be the same, so you'd get one when you divided them, so you'd get the maximum vapor pressure possible. Um, it's common for gasoline to have additives put into it that lower its vapor pressure, particularly during the summertime, so it doesn't evaporate so much, um, and it's uh, generally less dangerous with the summer blend. Um, Freezing point depression. So when a solute is added to a solvent, the freezing point of the solvent decreases because the solute particles interfere with the solvent particles forming crystals. So in order for freezing to happen, crystal formation has to occur. And if there's uh, impurities or extra particles in the way of that, then crystals can't form. So that's um, not only why salt is added to the roads, but also when you do an ice cream freezer, uh, you put salt in the ice on the outside and the ice-salt mixture gets much colder uh, because the freezing point of the ice is depressed. And that means that the milk, which has not had a bunch of salt added to it, that where your ice cream is at can freeze and uh, become a solid. Okay. Let's talk about boiling point elevation. 
So if uh, if you add solute to a liquid that's being heated, it's going to raise the boiling point of the liquid, and that is because the solute lowers the vapor pressure. That makes it more difficult for vaporization, uh, of which boiling is a form of vaporization, makes that more difficult. So if you add a bunch of salt to some water that you're heating, the water is going to boil at a slightly higher temperature. I know that when some people cook that they add salt uh, partially for flavoring and also partially to uh, enhance the uh, speed at which the cooking occurs. All right. So freezing point depression and boiling point elevation depend on the uh, concentration of the solution in molality. And that sounds very similar. In fact, it's only about one letter away from uh, molarity. Um, but anyways, uh, so molality is defined as the concentration in moles of solute per kilogram of solution. So values for molality are uh, cl usually close to values for molarity. Um, because a lot of times uh, with water-based solutions, a kilogram of solution is going to be very close to being a, uh, a liter of solution. However, uh, they are not exactly the same. Now, the reason why we threw molality in there is because we're going to use that uh, to describe boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. And again, I'm showing you equations for demonstration purposes. Fortunately, you will not have to do calculations here, but let me show you that the change in the boiling temperature or the change in the temp temperature at which a liquid freezes can be calculated as so. So there's a few things here. The little i is the number of particles in, into which the solute dissociates. I'm going to go over that a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, the m's are the molality, and then these, the kb and the kf are constants. So as you might guess, the kb is the boiling point constant, the kf is the freezing point constant, and basically what those tell you is how much the temperature changes per uh, molal uh, change in uh, concentration. So if I knew how many particles my solute dissociates into, say I had sodium chloride, that number would be 2 uh, for sodium chloride, and I knew the kb value for the uh, the solvent involved, and I knew the molality of the uh, sodium chloride that I was dissolving, then I could calculate the uh, change in temperature of the boiling point. And remember, it's boiling point elevation, so this temperature change would increase the boiling point, whereas this temperature change for freezing point depression would decrease the uh, freezing temperature. All right, now, the more particles that dissolve, the more uh, or the greater extent to which uh, collective properties are observed. So uh, let's look at the difference here. So glucose, um, glucose is a big molecule, but it's a covalent molecular compound. So, uh, and it's not an acid, so it doesn't dissociate to form any ions. So when it dissolves, it stays all together. So that means that you only form one particle there. Sodium chloride uh, is an ionic compound. And, you know, remember metal bonded to a nonmetal. Uh, when it dissolves in water, it's going to make two ions. It's going to make a sodium ion and a chloride ion. That would be a total of, count them, one, two particles. So that means that sodium chloride, whatever colligative properties uh, glucose had, at the same concentration and molality, sodium chloride would have double those properties. And then aluminum chloride, when it dissolves, well, it's an ionic compound too, uh, and you know, aluminum is plus three, chloride you know, minus one each, there's you know, three. So long story short, there's four ions here. So aluminum chloride, when dissolved in water, would have four times the colligative properties of glucose if they were at the same molal concentration. Now, that means that as you went from, if these were all at the same concentration, as you went from 
glucose to sodium chloride to aluminum chloride that the freezing point would decrease, the boiling point would increase, and the vapor pressure would decrease as you went through all of these in water at the same uh, same temperature and the same molal concentration. All right, here's a couple of other units by which we measure concentration while we're here. So uh, there's percent by volume. That's probably how you've seen a lot of things uh, sold, um, you know, in a store where there's a concentration reported. Rubbing alcohol is a great example because they sell 50%, 70%, and 91%. Don't know why they pick 91%, but there you go. Um, and that is the volume of the solute divided by the total volume. So with the rubbing alcohol, 70% rubbing alcohol means that you get 70% alcohol out of the total volume. So you, know, you might think about, well, that probably means that the other 30% is water. Um, percent by mass is another common way to express um, the concentration of something. And sometimes that is used. Sometimes it's not specified whether the concentration is in percent by volume and percent or percent by mass. And that's a point of frustration that I have. Um, and then finally, there's parts per million and parts per billion, which is uh, basically saying how many uh, parts out of a million parts are the solute. Those are used for things that are present in very low concentrations like uh, pollutants and stream water, for example. Thanks for watching.